same time, we heard someone talk about the fact that um, we rely on people who are in this country, foreigners in this country, most of them here illegally, to pick our crops. Not true. And while I believe in most cases, Americans will do most jobs, the history of California, the southwest portion of the United States, for about uh, the last 50 years has been, we cannot get Americans to work in the fields. We have had a foreign workforce um, as a major portion and now a dominant portion of the labor force uh, in California, in the Southwest, now over all parts of the country because we are moving to more seasonal crops and there is a consumer interest in having locally grown products. Therefore, you find what we have seen in California now being the case in other parts of the country. So I have for a long period of time said not other industries, but in agriculture, I think the case has been proven that we rely on foreign workers. We ought to have a program whereby we control who comes in, under what circumstances they come in, how long they stay, and if they violate, we kick them out. And I would have a, a, a program in which to make sure that foreign workers are not a something that an American employer would prefer in foreign agriculture, in agriculture that the amount of money that would otherwise go into Social Security go an equivalent amount, go into a fund that first of all would pay for the guest worker program, secondly pay for any emergency medical costs that are incurred by local jurisdictions, and third, there would be the remaining amount that would go into an individual account for that worker in his or her home country, but it would only be redeemable if they appeared physically in their home country during that two month period of time that they must be back in their own country since they can only be here for 10 months. Now I think that would be, and it would not put them on the road to citizenship. If they wanted to try and get a green card or citizenship, they'd go to the line in their own country and they get in line like everybody else because from the time we're little kids, we think if you cut in line, it's not right. I don't care if you're waiting to get water on the playground, you're waiting to go to the bathroom, you're waiting in the school lunch line, you see somebody cut in line, we know that's wrong. And I think it is uh, wrong for us to say the American people are biased or prejudiced or, or something uh, because they think it's wrong for people to cut in line. We can be both a, a, a country of immigrants and a country of laws. And so I think we have to, to do that sort of thing. At the same time, I would say we do have to do more to control our borders. And I have supported enhanced border uh, security. I have supported and had legislation with respect to increasing the number of people we have in border patrol. To have increased uh, uh, um, enforcement uh, on the interior. Uh, I support, in fact, I happen to be a co-sponsor uh, of the bill that came out of the House of Representatives, the Judiciary Committee for E-Verify. But I have said, that we cannot have be e verified pass until and unless we have a workable guest worker program for agriculture. Number one, it won't pass unless we do that. Number two, it would destroy agriculture if we didn't make some accommodation. And number three, it will make us, we will have a legal form, and then you don't have to create all these new laws to protect the workers. They have the same protections as anybody else, but they're not getting they're not getting in front of everybody else for citizenship or, or anything else. Well, there's no perfect solution. I've discovered that, particularly in immigration policy. Uh, information. They're going after your accounts. They're going after your identity. Um, we have to understand this is a new world. We've recognized it in the area of national defense. That is DOD, Department of Defense, now views that as the, the fourth domain. Uh, you know, land, sea, air, including space, and now cybersecurity. It is an area that is so important because we're so connected now in the cyber world. I mean, so much of what we do is connected to the internet. Um, so much of what we do it allows us to control actions from afar. Uh, and we do that with the controls. Dams, waterways, electrical grids. How do you protect that? How do you ensure that somebody doesn't get inside those programs? And then, anybody here hear of Stuxnet? Stuxnet? All right, what was Stuxnet? It was a program that somehow mysteriously got into the Iranian government nuclear weapon system 
and sat there for, I don't know what the unclassified time is, but it sat there for some period of time, unrecognized by the operators, giving the operators information that indicated that everything was going well, meanwhile commanding the elements of their program to take actions which destroy parts of their program, physically destroy. It was the first major example we had seen of a cybersecurity attack which resulted in destruction of a physical property to a tremendous degree while the operators of that property did not know it was occurring. Thank God whoever did it, I think on our side. Um, but now that that has been done, it has shown to be possible and you have to understand those who want to do us ill will start trying to do the very same thing. So cybersecurity is one of the most important issues we have. I, have, I happen to be the chairman of the Cybersecurity Subcommittee of Homeland Security. We have a major bill that, uh, that I've authored that uh, has passed through the subcommittee. We're going to have it uh, taken up by the full committee later, this, um, uh, later in March. And then the speaker has indicated that he wants us to have a bill, either our bill, several other bills, um, taken together or individual parts of our bills uh, to, to the floor so we can act on it. Similar legislation is taking place on the Senate side. Now here, here's something that I think is very important. The bill I have designates DHS, Department of Homeland Security, as the, the um, point of interaction with the private sector. And why do I do that? Uh, the bill that came out of the Intelligence Committee says, leaves it open, lets the administration decide. Well, there's a great agency of the federal government called NSA, right? That happens to be a part of the Department of Defense, probably has the greatest expertise in the cyber world, along with the Department, other parts of the Department of Defense in the entire world. But it is a military operation. It is part of the Department of Defense. We have a tradition in this country, and our Constitution presumes in this country, that we have civilian control of the military. <laughs> I think it would be very bad for us to designate NSA, as good as they are, as the point of contact for the domestic side of our government with the private sector. So I've specifically given that to DHS. That's why it's a little controversial uh, by some. Uh, it is an important issue that we go forward uh, with us, however. Uh, that we're putting forward in this current fiscal year. If we do not do something to over, uh, overturn the sequestration that was brought about by the budget, uh, not by the budget vote, but by the spending vote at the end of this last year, we will have an additional $600 billion taken out of defense. Uh, we're going to see tens of thousands of uh, reductions in the Army and in the Marine Corps. Uh, Air Force is taking their hits. Uh, Navy appears to be the least hit of all of them, but all of them are taking major hits. I happen to think it results in a military that is not capable of doing all the missions that we find necessary. And I think, frankly, uh, as we go forward in dealing with the budget, we have to establish priorities. The first priority of the government, as far as I'm concerned, is to create a modicum of security for us against domestic enemies and on the federal level against foreign enemies. And so I think that is uh, the first uh, obligation of the federal government. It seems to me as we look at the budget, we ought to say, are we able to do that or are we not able to do that? Um, cuts in TRICARE, I don't know. We'll have to look at that. Uh, I have not seen that with respect to, I know there have been some changes, but in terms of cuts, uh, we will take that. And the idea about there's going to be cuts with respect to active duty families, uh, we will look at that. Um, I've not heard that. National Security Keystone Pipeline, I'm a strong supporter of Keystone Pipeline. It brings us a, a, um, a healthy petroleum supply from one of our closest allies, both in terms of align with us uh, in culture and politically, but also geographically, and that's Canada. Why we would force Canada to send it to, to uh, Mexico is dumb. I mean, the president says he's holding up on it because of environmental concerns because the pipeline would, call, would uh, cross a major aquifer in Nebraska, in the Great uh, Plains of the United States. Guess what? There are a thousand pipelines already crossing that aquifer. <laughs> it seems to me if we build one now with the best technology, it will be the safest. Uh, we, should, uh, we should be, um, uh, 
We should be doing a much better job in terms of dealing with our existing resources. We have natural gas. We're the Saudi Arabia of the world of natural gas. There's shale oil that's available to us. Um, I frankly, and I know I'm a Californian, I was born here, raised here. My, my six brothers and sisters were born in California. My three children were born in California. My three kids all graduated from high school in this area. Uh, but, I mean, I was born one block from the beach in Long Beach, California. Uh, I love the beach. Uh, but I also saw oil islands in the middle of Long Beach Harbor. And I saw what they produced, and I know that every school in California got the benefit of the oil being pumped out of Long Beach Harbor because it went into a coffee fund, which uh, gave funds to every school district and every community college. I don't know whether it still does, but it did that during the time I was a kid growing up. And frankly, um, if there's offshore drilling on a, on a state, the state ought to get some royalties. We could get billions of dollars of royalties to the California state and government coffers if we had what I consider to be environmentally protected um, exploration and production. Look, the president goes down to Brazil and he applauds the Brazilian government for their offshore drilling and thanks them for buying American products, that is American drilling equipment, to do it offshore. And then he ends up his speech by saying, and we wish to be your best customer. Now, now, I can understand why we want to be, we'd rather have Brazil than some country in the Middle East where it seems to always be in, in, um, either in conflict or on the verge of conflict, but shouldn't we be producing it in America, using American jobs, American equipment, and Income tax returns, yes, they ought to be uh, uh, less complicated. I mean, I, I'm serious about that. When the Secretary of Treasury can't do his own tax returns, and he was using TurboTax and forgot to pay $15,000. Yeah, I'd forget it too. Um, one of the problems that I realized early on was, after the voter fraud occurs, it's almost impossible to prove it. You have to stop it. We tried to do it by way of deterrence, saying that we would investigate uh, any allegations. Because, you know, we found some things where there were dogs and cats that were registered as voters in California. Um, and they were alive. Um, <laughs> you require a simple voter ID, a simple ID to vote. I mean, it was just mentioned, you can't get on an airplane if you don't show ID. Um, there's so many things which require ID in this country. Uh, and they say, well, if you don't have a driver's license. All I know is my mother-in-law, who's been deceased now for 20 years, um, she never drove, and she had an ID from the uh, DMV, uh, and that was 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, she didn't even, she never graduated from eighth grade, I think. I mean, it wasn't like you needed an education to figure that out. Uh, she was able to do that. I, I just don't understand this. In Mexico, you have to have a, uh, an ID. It's a voter ID. I believe it has a picture on it. I think it has a thumbprint on it. And they swipe it after you vote to make sure that uh, that's not used anywhere else. But they're so much more advanced than we are. So uh, <laughs> you don't understand that. I mean, I happen to believe that one of the, the problems is this administration, this Justice Department, is now investigating states that have adopted voter ID. I mean, going against it. And yet, in the uh, new Black Panther case, where I've seen the film of it, you had two people dressed in uh, what I consider to be martial arts costumes, uh, one with a, uh, a long club in his hand, and kept whacking it on his hand as people came in, and made comments about people's race, and yet uh, this Justice Department didn't find that serious enough to go after in a serious way. And yet they're going after states because they think voter ID is uh, cruel. Interesting enough, there is a, a, a former member of Congress with whom I served, um, Archer Davis, a brilliant Harvard uh, law grad, uh, happens to be African American from the state of Alabama, <coughs> ran for governor, lost in the primary down there, who just came out about three months ago and said, look, I've got to admit I was wrong. Um, there is voter fraud in this country, and the people who really are uh, harmed by it are those in the minority community because people are abusing them by having 
people vote who don't have a right to vote. Uh, now, he was roundly criticized by people of his own party for saying that, but he had the guts to say that. And we're going to have to have some intelligent, informed, adult conversation about how we protect the right to vote. Look, no one should be denied the right to vote by the kind of laws we had in the past. Jim Crow laws uh, requiring you to uh, own property, uh, literacy tests that weren't literacy tests. There were efforts to make sure that certain minorities didn't vote. But as much as that is a violation of the Constitution, so is it having someone vote who doesn't have a right to vote, who cancels out my vote, or cancels out your vote. Now, we are going to say that. Oh, I've been told we, we've, we've got to get out of here on time for the school district, but I do want it to uh, respond to that one uh, question or something that was brought up on a couple occasions. One is, uh, the misnomer, the misstatement, the factually in error statement made by Nancy Pelosi uh, and the DCCC that somehow I made a decision and my committee made a decision that did not allow the televising of a hearing that's not an official hearing tomorrow to be held uh, by the Democratic Steering Committee. I never made any decision. It was never brought to me. Um, there is a uh, officer of the House who follows the regulations that have been established by the House Administration Committee, of which I'm now chairman. The House Administration Committee set a, a precedent, set a, a rule on this. When we were in the minority, the Democrats were in the majority. There was an attempt by the previous uh, officer of the House to change that. Uh, the Democratic chairman of the committee rejected that and said we will not allow televising of, under those circumstances. He's the one who rejected it, and it's in 2008, I believe it was. I got the document where he actually denies it. I have followed in the tradition of my Democratic predecessor, and that's the rule that we have. Uh, that was the rule that was cited when there was the request made for this, so it has nothing to do with denying anybody, man or woman. And frankly, uh, I've got two daughters. I have uh, four granddaughters. I have a 93-year-old mother, I have four sisters, and some suggestion that somehow I don't talk to women. And, no, I'm serious about this. That somehow people have the arrogance to say that they are the only ones who know what any women say, and that anybody who disagrees with them obviously doesn't talk to women, is the kind of, uh, with all due respect, nonsense that is not adult conversation. Now, what the Obama administration is saying by their rule, which they then amended, but they haven't amended, by the way, they sent the first rule to be published, and then the president said he's going to change it. There's a promise he's going to change the future, but it changes nothing at all. He said that um, religious organizations will be required to provide health care which violates their tenants. Now, you can agree or disagree with the tenants. The question is, does the federal government have the right to tell a religious organization that they can't? So what the administration has done in this and another case, by the way, in which they lost 9-0 in the U.S. Supreme Court just in the last month, in which they tried to say the government will be able to determine who is a minister and who isn't a minister. Remember that? They argued that before the U.S. Supreme Court. They lost 9-0, which is part of an assault on religious liberty. And then they tried to redefine it in that argument before the court and in what they are doing in this other area by changing it from religious liberty to the right of worship. Now, why is that important? If they limit religious liberty to the right of worship, then the only thing you have in terms of your religious liberty is that which is confined to your worship in your church, your synagogue, uh, your mosque. That's not true. So, then they wanted to determine who is a minister and who isn't a minister. All of a sudden, you are limiting religious liberty down to what the government allows you to, or how to exercise it. It limits the ability of you to exercise your religion. <laughs> Look, Catholic Church did not build 
hospitals and schools as areas of worship. They did it because it is part of the Christian calling to heal the sick, take care of the poor, And for the President of the United States to have an edict which says, no, 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 it's got to be more limited than that, substantially changes the idea of religious liberty. And with all due respect to the previous person who said she's a Catholic and disagrees with the Catholic uh, Church's teaching on a particular issue, that's not the question. The question is, is a church able to articulate its principles and not be required to violate them by paying for something which is against their principles. It has nothing to do with whether people make decisions with respect to that practice or any other practice. It has to do with whether a church is forced to provide a benefit which they believe they should not provide as a matter of moral conscience. That's what it is. Catholic Church since the Know Nothings of 1850. And if you don't know anything about the Know Nothings, they were a part of the beginnings of the Republican Party. And James Blaine, Senator, I believe, from Nebraska, tried to pass a constitutional amendment that said all churches could get government support because church schools at that time were getting government, except Catholics. <laughs> and he ran on a, a program of uh, one right then and it's not right now. And to, to try and change it and say something else for us, as, as the former speaker of the House said, they used the excuse for religious liberty. That's an insult to all. And by the way, the second panel of uh, Congressman Ice's uh, committee was made up of women. He's called uh, religious freedom. Just to set the, the record straight. Um, we, I'm sorry, we, 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 I, I, we overstayed our time. We promised the school this would be out at 8.30, and um, we're just going to tell them we're in overtime. So I'm going to ask her why I am. Thank you very much. What is your name? Uh, Albert Gilding, Sr. And what district do you live in? Uh, I come from Carmichael, and, it's the, and that's the third district. Okay, and why did you come down to Congress and Lung Congressman Lundgren's town hall meeting tonight? I wanted to hear what he had to say. I also wanted to hear what the people had to say that asked questions on it. <clears throat> I hadn't really uh, planned on asking a question, although I had a couple of them. I thought, but I really wanted to sit there and listen to the meeting, and it was conducted very well. Uh, the people were very erudite in the ones that asked questions. <laughs> they asked most of the questions I would have asked myself uh, if I had wanted to stand up and ask them and had the presence of mind to ask them all. Did you ask a question? No, I didn't ask any questions. Okay. Well, what kinds of the qu what kinds of questions were you most fascinated by that people asked? Well, if you understand my hat, uh, I go back to the mid-80s uh, tax revolt, and uh, I had the hat, and I decided, because through the period of time since, there have been many politicians that said, the tax revolt is dead. People uh -huh. don't want to talk about taxes anymore, and they were very uh, 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 surprised at the fact that people still want to talk about taxes. We're in the same situation now, the only the, the, it's a much more grave situation, mm -hmm. but still uh, you have this uh, a, a Tea Party revolt in 09, and essentially told you that the people were seething about being overtaxed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, from my revolt days, I became a, a, a voter that was a single issue voter by just the understanding that they weren't doing anything about taxes. So mm -hmm. my understanding is anybody that will not promise me that they will not raise my taxes and they won't promise that they'll lower them, will not get my vote. And so I have voted, that was the primary condition of every time I voted. Uh, so Do you I'm think in that the same situation here, uh -huh. and I want to see if Dan Lundgren was going to tell me that he was not going to raise taxes. I and think did he say that? I think by indirection, 
I think by indirection, he assured me that that was the case. So do you plan on voting for Congressman Mungern? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you feel that, what do you, I mean, in regards to taxes, do you think that the there's an inequality in the amount of taxes that are taxed upon, for instance, lower class, middle class, upper class? Um, uh, I'll tell you, <coughs> if I had asked a question, what, do you, what exactly is, do you think this is, this is wrong? what I would have mm -hmm. said. <coughs> okay. A tax on one is a tax on all. If you don't understand that, don't believe that, tax the rich and see who pays the bill. The middle class, because they're the ones that buy most of the consumption. <coughs> the people, the rich, are the ones who produce the things in this country, and if they have to pay higher taxes, the, the cost of production goes up. Uh, the middle class buy less, so therefore you have less uh, production uh, sold. <coughs> The poor do not escape this because they now have higher prices of things and they can buy less of what they actually need. So a tax on one is a tax on all. Don't play but what about this. taxes specifically on corporations or um, big businesses? All what that about tax that? goes into the product and the middle class pays the bill. Now that's what you got to understand. No matter who levies the tax on, on a particular group of people, the whole economy will be affected by that tax. And we can see this by the fact that we have uh, the highest tax, corporate tax rate in the world and everybody else is out competing us. And that's the reason why we import so much more than we export. So what do you think that needs to change? What do you what what specifically when since you, you plan on voting for Congressman Lundgren, what specifically do you want to see him change as far as taxes are concerned? The entire tax code. I'd like to also see them uh, uh, take out the Federal Reserve System. Uh, the reason why uh, they have artificially lowered the interest rate. I'm a retired person. I have money in the bank that was drawing interest that was part of my retirement income. That has disappeared. Mm -hmm. It hasn't. That hasn't satisfied them. And so now the Federal Reserve has flushed. 500 billion dollars and, and plans on doing more into the money supply. That now degrades the, the, the value of a dollar. They are now are in the middle of my uh, uh, savings account taking the principal on top of taking the interest. Now do you think I that, that is not only unconstitutional, that is not even legal theft. Mm -hmm. And so it makes the people who are doing this criminals that should be put in jail. Um, so as far as the Federal Reserve is concerned, you're, I'm sure you're well aware that the Federal Reserve is a privatized entity that is a part of the... And who made it a supposedly private entity? And who runs the Federal Reserve except the party in power. And the Democrat Party has learned how to manipulate the Federal Reserve System to their benefit from the beginning because they knew what they were creating. Well, created. even before then, um, the Federal Reserve was c concerned in the, back in the 20s and 30s um, when you saw a lot of movements around the time of Prohibition, for example, and things like that. And the concern was that the Federal Reserve is a privatized company that, so when the government wants to say build schools, they have to buy, they have to ask the Federal Reserve for money and then they are essentially um, given an interest rate upon uh, returning that money back to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve system <coughs> is a committee that's unconstitutionally uh, uh, organized mm -hmm. <coughs> to do the work of government that the representatives should be doing. <clears throat> you have the same thing uh, uh, here now with that super committee, unconstitutional. And what was the first thing they did? <clears throat> they made it to where the military would be the first budget cut after they'd already cut deeply into the military earlier than that. <clears throat> and all the Democrats had to do was to not talk about any reductions in the debt 
and the military would pay the bill. What's your concern? Now, that's, that's a super committee, just the same thing as the Federal Reserve. They're running the country without any regard to the people who are voting, or whether or not they got their, their, their backing to do what they're doing. What's so your, that's unconstitutional. What's your concern with military cuts? The primary purpose of this whole federal government is protection of the people. And if you do not provide the military with the funds they need to protect the people, then you are not doing your duty as the President of the United States when you've sworn to protect the Constitution and the country from enemies, both uh, domestic and foreign. Do so consequently, the military should be the last budget that has to be cut when we don't have enough money to run the government. Do you realize that 60% of taxpayer dollars is spent directly?